Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that would like to remind you that True Crime Garage is 100% gluten-free. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are very proud to be featuring a listener selection, Blackback Honey Rye. That's Whiskey Rage Cage by the good, good people over at the Silverback Distillery. I've been loving me some rye lately, Captain, and because Blackback is infused with real honey liqueur, it's smooth sipping here today in the garage, my friends. Garage grade, four out of five bottle caps. And this week's fridge is full thanks to our good friends. First up, we have Megan P. and Matt S. in Dallas, Texas. And a big we like your jib to Brooke and all the girls at the Columbus Salon Institute. Here's a big, big cheers and thank you to Cameron in Capitola, California. And a big we like your jib to Holly in Omimi, Ontario. And next we have Kelly from Verona, Pennsylvania, recommending Rosé Ale by Ryan Geist. Of course, we love Ryan Geist. And last but certainly not least, in fact, the best, we have Shanna K, who wants us to talk about Shana-na. the Golden <laughs> Who wants us to talk about the Golden State Killer? Of course, Shanna is in LA. I love it. And also I love that everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. And again, we're way behind. So be or patient. we're way ahead. Or <laughs> imagine that. We Think don't, about that for a minute. We don't we're know way which ahead. way. We don't know which way we are. But be patient, because everybody that, that donates, we give a shout out. It doesn't matter if it's little or big. We appreciate all the support, and also if you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe and leave a five star review on iTunes and that is enough of the business. All right everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Bakersfield, California, is a city of 380,000, about 100 miles north of Los Angeles. Bakersfield is the county seat of Kern County and the ninth largest city in California. It's considered to be a pretty wholesome family values type of town. But in the late 1970s and early 80s, something strange was going on. A series of murders began. These murders had just enough similarities and just enough linking them to make people wonder, are they connected? Now, no one shared suspicions that an undetected serial killer was at work. This was something totally different, something very strange and something very rare. What we have here is a faint pattern to the killings, suggesting an underlying darkness, something deep down at their root. What would emerge was an old boys network, a dirty club with members scattered amongst the upper echelons of Bakersfield's power elite, a ring populated by public officials and trusted city leaders. But this network wasn't just about cronyism or corruption. At its root was pedophilia. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the story of the Lords of Bakersfield. Bakersfield, California, 1978. The city was described by CNN as clean, safe, conservative, Republican, and religious. Yet over a span of seven years from 1978 to 1985, there were five unusual murders. 
The cases are explored in a sensational 2003 expose that ran in the local paper, The Californian, written by Robert Price, a columnist for the paper and was assisted by assistant managing editor Lois Henry. Many of the facts stated here by us come from this lengthy and scandalous column. On January 4, 1978, a gardener working on a property for a house on Beach Street in Bakersfield could not help but notice blood seeping out from under the back door of the house. This alarming sight caused the gardener to call the police. Officers rushed to the house, and after making their way into the home, they found a man lying on the floor covered in blood. The man was naked, and it appeared he had been beaten and stabbed, but somehow he was still alive. He was unresponsive. Paramedics arrived on the scene almost as soon as police. When they found the man who was barely still clinging to life, they went to work, applying life-saving efforts, and then they rushed him to the hospital. Now, the gardener told police that the home belonged to a man named Tommy Tarver. The badly beaten man was quickly identified to be, in fact, Tommy Tarver. Yeah, Tommy was in his 40s, but he's pretty well known in the community. He was also doing pretty well financially. Mm -hmm. Tommy owned a popular hair salon called Mr. T. Worcester, located on F Street in Bakersfield. This salon was frequented by many of the rich and powerful in town. It appears Tommy lived alone. He had been married twice before, both ending in separation or divorce, and Tommy was living an openly gay lifestyle. Now, we said he was unresponsive. In fact, he was in a coma and remained so for about five days until he died from his injuries that he suffered during this heinous attack. Police were looking for a suspect, and the neighborhood was in shock. Police canvassed the area, talking to anyone in close proximity, wanting to know, did anyone see or hear anything strange leading up to their gruesome findings inside the house on Beach Street? A couple that lived nearby told police that the night before, a man in his early to mid-twenties knocked on their door, asking if they could call him a cab, to which they agreed to help. According to the papers, they did not notice anything strange about his appearance. However, while the man remained at the doorway, while they were placing the call for the cab, something fell from one of the man's pockets. It was a silver spoon. After calling for the cab, this was the last that the couple saw of this man. The spoon was later found by police. Now, that same day, police got a big lead in what would later turn out to be a homicide investigation. This lead came by way of a traffic stop. When an officer pulled a vehicle over, the officer very quickly discovered two things way out of the ordinary. First, the car was stolen and its rightful owner was Tommy Tarver, Mm -hmm. the man they found attacked in his home, who is now in a coma lying in a hospital bed. Just a couple days away from death, mind you. The second thing that they noticed was that the vehicle was being operated by a 13-year-old boy. This is 13-year-old Robert Glenn Mistrell. He was caught behind the wheel of a soon-to-be dead man's stolen vehicle. So we have 13-year-old Robert that's driving this guy's car that was viciously attacked, but he also has some of his items in the car with him. So, of course, police wanted to know everything, and young Robert did seem to have quite a bit to tell them. Mm -hmm. Robert admitted to knowing the much older Tommy Tarver and, in fact, admitted to going to his home. Robert told the police he had been living in seedy hotels with his alcoholic mother. Robert said he got by on selling sexual favors to men for money and had been doing so since he was just 11 years old. So Robert and his mother were living or staying, however you choose to look at it, at the Rancho Bakersfield Motel. Now, according to Robert, this is where he met Tommy Tarver. This was some time before the actual attack. Tommy offers to pay Robert to mow his lawn, and Robert agrees. But according to Robert, as soon as he gets to Tommy's house, Tommy starts putting the moves on him. Now, Robert looks like a good suspect so far, right? He's caught driving Tommy's car with items belonging to Tommy, 
But here's where the timeline for the night of the attack, this is where it gets a little wonky. A taxi driver told police that on that night, the night of what would turn out to be a murder, Mm -hmm. he drove Tommy, a man in his 40s, and 13-year-old Robert to Rancho Bakersfield Motel coffee shop around 11.30 p.m. This motel was apparently a meeting place for men in town, many of whom were living secret double lives. Mm -hmm. The cabbie said he later drove Tommy and a different escort home. This was 24-year-old William Kenneth Manley, a university student from Santa Rosa. William Manley was also staying at the Rancho Bakersfield Motel, and there he said he met Tommy at the bar. The two decided to go clubbing, but Tommy wanted to stop at his house first to change his clothes. While there, Manley witnessed two other men arrive, then argue with Tommy, and then one of them began engaging in sex with Tommy. Manley decided to leave, but not before pocketing about $1,000 worth of silverware and jewelry from the home on his way out. Because of the witness, this is the couple that identified Manley as the man who stopped and asked to call a cab, he was arrested and charged with the murder of Tommy Tarver. Robert Mistral, the 13-year-old, was charged only with burglarizing Tommy's home and Tommy's hair salon as well. Apparently, the salon was an easy target for Robert because he had a key to get into the place. Now, it's unclear if Tommy ever gave him the key, or my guess is that Robert got the key when he burglarized and then had the keys to Tommy's car. At the trial, Manley's defense tried to claim that Robert Mistral had been with Tommy earlier that night and was possibly a suspect. But the deputy DA convinced the judge not to let Robert be questioned. In the end, Manley was acquitted of the murder of Tommy Tarver, and Robert got six months in the San Felipe Boys Home, a Kern County youth facility, for the burglary charges. The murder of Tommy Tarver remains unsolved. At the time, of course, this was a shocking murder. But no one realized that this would be the first in a series of killings involving what later would appear to be an underground community in Bakersfield. Glenn Fitz was, well, at least according to one article, this article described him as, quote, a pillar of the law enforcement community, end quote. He was the former director of the Kern County Police Academy, a member of the Bakersfield Police Commission, and recently retired police science instructor from Bakersfield College. Unfortunately, Glenn's wife passed away. So by April 1979, he was 56 years old, retired, and living single. Around this time, he started hanging out in a nearby park where he was interacting with the teenagers there. He would routinely invite local teens back to his place. Well, that's not creepy at all. No. Come on over. Come, Hey, I'm going to just hang out at the park and stare at kids all day. Back then, they didn't even have cable. Mm. He started hosting parties with teenagers, and this is what was expected. Well, the short of it is he was trading things like beer, alcoholic drinks, and pot for sex or sex acts with both teenage boys and possibly teenage girls as well. Mm. On April 10th, 1979, Glenn threw a birthday party for one of his teen friends. Attending this party was about 20 teens, some of them as young as 14 years old. Yeah, come over. Let's have a party for my teenager friend. Where's the party at? El Creepo's house. Well, at the party was a 14-year-old named Dana Charlene Butler. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dana went missing And it seems like the last time anyone remembers interacting with the young girl, well, Dana was alive and well and wantingly attended this very party. It wasn't until three days later that she was found dead, dumped in a park. Reports were that she was found with 30 to 40 shallow knife wounds and two deep fatal wounds. It appeared she was tortured before being killed. And the body contained more evidence. Investigators found one of Fitz's pubic hairs as well as dog hairs from both of his dogs 
on the body. This was the 70s, and hair evidence was standard in lieu of yet-to-be-developed DNA. The police searched Fitz's home, and just as suspected, they found blood matching Dana's. Witnesses told police investigators that Fitz replaced the plumbing fixtures and some carpeting inside the home just the day after Dana went missing. With mounting evidence, a grand jury was convened, and they interviewed everyone, this including Fitz and the plumber, but just as this was really picking up speed, it came to a screeching halt. This is when the DA's office inexplicably declined to ask for an indictment for murder against Glenn Fitz. Mm. The head of the Bakersfield Police Department Detectives Unit told the Californian, the newspaper, that he was baffled as to why charges weren't brought, as, in his opinion, there was ample evidence in all of the files that he had seen. Now, meanwhile, the Californian reported that there was a suspect but never named Glenn Fitz as the suspect. And they say this because he had not been named by police. But nevertheless, it appears that the whole town seemed to know who the suspect was. Parents knew that Fitz was the suspect and they started picketing around his house, the county administration's building, and right outside of the courthouse building as well. Again, if you know this guy is a creep, then why are you letting him why are you letting kids go to his house for a party? It's ridiculous. Likely the if you're talking about the parents, it's likely they were unaware that their children were going over to his house to get drunk and do drugs. Anyway, these people, these 200 people, it's about 200 people that participated in these picketing uh, events outside of the, the two buildings and his home. Obviously, they wanted an arrest made in this case. They were calling themselves the Mothers of Bakersfield. Examples of the mob's picketing signs, well, some of them read, quote, who is blocking the investigation, question mark, and DA office, what are you afraid of, question mark. Now, the other thing here is the local sheriff's department, they were very confident that Fitz was good for this crime. And the DA's office and then the grand jury failed to bring an indictment. So local law enforcement, and I'm guessing that this was not public knowledge at the time, likely this was probably more of a behind closed doors type of thing, Mm -hmm. but it sounds to me like basically the local law enforcement was threatening the DA. Okay. So if you don't charge this man for the murder of this girl, then we are going to push to charge the same man with any kind of lesser charge. So at the very least we can make an arrest, right? Right. We're going to get this jackass no matter what. It's basically what they're saying. Well, I don't know if it was the mob of people or the behind the scenes activity that we just explained, or if it was a combination of both, but Mm -hmm. whatever it was, it seems like the DA hand was, was forced because eventually The DA pressed charges against Fitz, but not for the murder of a 14-year-old, but instead for suspicion of furnishing drugs to a minor. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this is an extremely lenient charge based off of the general facts and evidence of the case. But wouldn't they be able to, like, charge him with multiple counts of this for, like, the parties and stuff that he was throwing? I believe there were five charges that were pushed forth, and three of them were felony charges. Now... This did result in Fitz being arrested on May 21st. Apparently, no indictment was ever handed down. A Pulitzer Prize winning expose many years later on the corruption in Bakersfield stated that, quote, senior prosecutors withheld key evidence from the panel, meaning the grand jury. Mm, Right. I just wonder what his connection is to this prosecutor. Well, he was retired law enforcement. He he held all three of those different positions throughout his career, being the former director of Kern County Police Academy, member of the Bakersfield Police Commission, and retired police science instructor from Bakersfield College. No, no, right, right. I I get that part, but you just wonder how close these individuals are or if they're, you know, a part of some group outside of 
uh, their jobs. It really, really makes you wonder, right? Uh, because what you're talking about is why the hell, who cares if they had some kind of connection on a professional basis? We're talking about murder here, the murder of a child. And we're also talking about evidence to point to him as being the very likely suspect right. in this case. Now, I understand that her body is found out in the park somewhere, and but we have evidence of, of him or, or we his got dogs pubes, man. on the body, right? right? We got pubes. Well, and here's the other thing, too. Mm-hmm. This is one thing that I found very interesting. Okay, so his, his previous job of the police science instructor, mm-hmm. and then we have the neighbors claiming that he they were aware that he was replacing plumbing and carpeting inside his home yeah. the, the day after it's believed that she went missing. That seems like somebody with one. Okay. Look, yeah. If you got large blood stains everywhere, no duh, you, you, you get rid of the carpet and try to replace that. But on top of that factor in the, the, the job that he had a police science instructor, he is aware of certain things that the general public would not be aware of. And it makes you really wonder what what plumbing fixtures was he replacing? You know, we've talked about some cases where the where law enforcement will go in with their techs and remove drains and drain pipes right. because they know that they're going to find evidence down there. And that's something that a lot of people don't consider when they're trying to cover up a homicide. Right. So on you got that on the one hand, you go, okay, well, we're, like you said, replacing the carpet's not a big deal. Pipes. You got to have some kind of knowledge about that, but then you're going to leave pubes and dog hair on the victim. It seems to not make sense, right? Um, it, I mean, a lot of this case is not going to make sense. Spoiler no, but you alert. mean like that you you would do all these necessary steps, you know, to to your house, but you want to do that to the to the actual crime scene. I feel like what we have here is a man that panicked and thought that the first thing and most important thing to do at the fastest point mm-hmm. was to get the body out of his house. Yeah. And then went back in and tried to do damage control to his house. Now, mind you, he went to all this effort and, and what did police find inside of his home blood that matched the same blood type as Dana's. So do you know where they found that at? I don't know. It seemed like a lot of the, the work that he was doing appeared to be taking place in the, in the bathroom or the bathroom area of the home. Right. I couldn't find where they said specifically where the blood was in fact found, but look, I, I believe 100% that she was probably killed in that bathroom or moved to the bathroom shortly after some kind of attack took place. We're talking about possibly a prolonged torture mm. that went on in this case as well. From from what little we can see and observe in this case. Again, it's sometimes when there are those points of evidence, they don't actually report on them. Now, one thing that does go in the way of a defense for why maybe the DA did not press charges or did not get that indictment that the public was so very eagerly seeking. Mm -hmm. Apparently there was some kind of quote screw up. That's, that's how it's been reported as a screw up at the coroner's office. Now, apparently for some reason, and I'm uncertain of their exact protocol back there and then, but they failed to do a time of death test on Dana Butler uh, so they, they never established a time of death. Now this, this only really becomes difficult once you do get to trial because with her missing for several days before her body's found, eh, your, your, you know, alibi or need for an alibi, all that gets pretty dicey when you've not really honed in or even created a window of time for the possible time of death. So there was also some doubts out there as to whether 56 year old Glenn Fitz, who many say was in poor health with a heart condition, if he could have in fact killed the girl and then disposed of her on his own. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we know that he was 
working out daily at the park. Within days of all of this mess here, Glenn Fitz died of a gunshot to the head, leaving behind a strange note, which read, Dana Butler was last seen in front of a church between 11.39 and 12.30. I, on the morning of April 9, was home waiting for... And there the note ends. The death of Glenn Fitz was officially ruled a suicide, which we should point out some weird things with this as well, because first, Fitz's body was found outdoors between his home and his neighbor's. And second, a neighbor reported hearing two gunshots on that day. Now, the murder of Dana Butler remains unsolved. Glenn Fitz may have killed her or she may have been killed by someone else. It does seem, however, whoever killed her did so inside Fitz's home. This was the second case where an older man associated with teenage boys ended up dead. And here again, this man could have been preying on teens for sex. Welcome back. Cheers, mates. For all of our old episodes, check out the Stitcher app and check out our weekly bonus show called Off the Record. You can do so at truecrimegarage.com. Awesome. Welcome back to you, Captain. Welcome. Now, the next case we have here takes place in 1981. Mm -hmm. So we have 55-year-old Edwin Buck. Edwin was the personnel director for Kern County. He was associated with a name we have heard before. This is young Robert Mistrell. At this time, Robert is about 17 years old, and he told police that he met Buck at Beach Park in 1979 when he was 15. Police were aware of activity at this park and actually warned Edwin Buck and other men there numerous times about sexual activity and sexual activity with minor boys. Robert hung out with Buck on a few occasions. Buck caught Robert stealing money and tools from him on one of these occasions and threatened to have Robert arrested for the theft. Buck told Robert that he would not involve the police if Robert agreed to participate in making a porno movie with another young boy. So always a good idea to throw blackmail and child pornography into the blender of totally effed up situations, right? Yeah, but can you imagine? I mean, you're 17 years old. You stole some stuff. The guy goes, I'm going to the cops, right? Or you can have sex with this kid. Like, go to the cops, asshole. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and I think I don't don't want to get into that too much because I think there's there's a lot of there's more weight to stuff to that. sift through okay. before we before we get into some of that stuff but what we have here is robert doesn't tell you know old nasty uncle buck to go to the police yeah instead he recruits a friend and this is 18 year old roy carmenish but roy wasn't recruited for the purpose of starring in a homemade movie he had an entirely different role to play So one night, Robert invited Edwin Buck for a moonlight drive. Once they got out into a nice spot, Buck pulled the vehicle over and parked the car. Mm -hmm. Roy, who was unbeknownst to Buck following them, this is all a part of Robert's plan, Roy pulled up in front of them. Robert apparently knew what was going to go down because later he said he retreated to Roy's car. This is where he sat so he would not have to see anything. Roy was high on LSD at the time and attacked Buck. Roy stabbed Buck several times. He hit him in the head with a hammer and he slit his throat. The two boys then stuffed Buck's body into the trunk of Buck's car. They drove the car back to Buck's home and parked it in the garage. Once there... They robbed the house and set it on fire. Later, investigators found Buck's body in the trunk 
of his burned out car. This was three days later. Robert and Roy were soon arrested. And one of the bits of evidence that they found in this whole scenario was they found a microwave oven from Buck's home. They found this at Robert's mother's place. Now, this case was a media sensation for just about as many reasons as all of us could imagine. Robert would be tried as an adult. It seemed that he was suspected in the unsolved murder of Tommy Tarver as well. This is because a hammer was also thought to have been used in that murder. Now, at trial, Robert and Roy, they turned on each other. Robert blamed Roy, stating that Roy was the one that killed Edwin Buck. Roy's defense presented Robert's involvement not only in the Tommy Tarver murder that was still unsolved, as, but presented that as evidence that he was guilty of Edwin Buck's murder as well. What came out of Robert's trial, rather than just the facts surrounding the murder of Edwin Buck, is why this case is famous. Right. Robert had all sorts of firsthand stories to tell about secret homosexuality, including sex with minors, and all of the corruption among the elite in Bakersfield, what he called the Lords of Bakersfield. All right, we need to provide some background information here. So until these cases broke in the late 70s and early 80s, Bakersfield's dirty little secret was just that. It was a secret. Whispers and rumors existed as far back as the 1950s of a loose network of powerful, prominent white men who used their power and influence to protect each other, and they harbored a dark secret. They were into homosexual pedophilia in some cases, and just sex with very young men and others. Stories about a so-called white orchid society were told in town for years but no one could really substantiate these tales, which were of a group of older male predators victimizing young men and boys. So then in 1985, there's a lawsuit by a former police officer, which alleged a network of corruption, favoritism, and cronyism in Kern County. A 2,000-page exhibit to this lawsuit addressed a pedophile ring among the power elite using the term the Lords of Bakersfield. The lawsuit was dismissed, but the moniker stuck, and the Lords legend, it has its name. Mm -hmm. The 2003 Californian expose about the Lords of Bakersfield describes it as formerly the province of conspiracy theorists, except that now it seemed there was some truth to the legend. Yeah, it seemed like there was some validity to these stories, but this this was a really hard case to research. There's not a lot out there. Well, and I want to go ahead and throw this out there uh, for everybody listening, and primarily for those that are already familiar with this case. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is one of those weird situations where the tentacles of this story kind of spread far and wide and through a lot of different people, a lot of different buildings, organizations, and such. And it's also a story that may span not only a, a couple of decades, but several decades. I mean, we have rumors going back to the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So anybody listening to our presentation of this story, please keep in mind that there may be things that, that could be connected to this, things that might not be connected to this. When you really look at this story and, and you, you realize that you have to present it in some form and in some light, it gets difficult along the way to decide which portions to include and not to include. The connections here are not always clear. So if in our review of this case, if you believe that we missed something, we may have just, it may just not have been presented us to have a clear connection. Or we had to pick and choose some of these to include and to not include. Right. So the ones that we're going to go over here are the ones that that I could find were, were for the most part, believed or reported to be, be believed as part of this whole legend of the Lords of Bakersfield. So 
let's go back to that murder trial, right? We have Robert Mistrell, the, 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 the one that was involved in the first case that we talked about and mm-hmm. now involved in being on trial for the murder of Edwin Buck. He testified to some bombshell information. That's clear. Now, although he was under 18, he claims that he slept with as many as 150 men in both Bakersfield and in Los Angeles. He says many of these men were people of prominence in the community, men who held positions of power and influence. These men were politicians, media, judges, attorneys, county executives, and more. And Robert took this a step further. He named names. Now, one of the names that he named was Edwin Buck and Tommy Tarver, of course. Here's where things get a little a little dicey here for mm-hmm. me, Captain. Go, Harry. I have a longer list of individuals that he named, and I don't know that... I don't know that they're all that they all should be named by by me. I don't know that I feel comfortable naming all of them. I will say that one of the other names that he mentioned was Glenn Fitz, the ex policeman or um, police officer who was suspected in Dana's Dana Butler's murder. The another interesting person that he names is Ted Fritz. Okay, let's the different people. Ted Fritz was the editor and co-owner of the Californian, the the local newspaper that we've referenced more than once. Fritz was notorious in town for his legendary parties with the wealthy elite. And here again, there are a lot of names that are thrown out as having attended these parties. And I will, I refuse to name them here because, because of just this. I don't want anybody to be under the assumption that any of these individuals are guilty of anything at all just because they attended some party. Right. We're kind of seeing this in the media right now with with the arrest and the, the suicide of Epstein and having these black books and, and all these people connected. You know, you, you can't, um, I think it's irresponsible to mm-hmm. just make the leap that some creepo has your contact information and therefore that you're associated with every wrongdoing he he did i i think it's uh, a irresponsible leap and we we need to look for more evidence correct and what what i will say here is look i'm not foolish enough to believe that nobody that attended one of ted fritz's parties is not guilty has never done a bad thing in their life right you know i i don't wouldn't believe that for one bit but as you pointed out I believe it's irresponsible to throw out the suggestion that just because somebody attended a party that they had a, there's a deeper relationship there that they, that whoever, you know, it's, it's just downright wrong to, to imply that anybody associated with an individual is guilty of all the same things that that individual is likely guilty of. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So his whole part in this story is he more so than these, these parties, is that he's the editor and the co-owner of the Californian, of that newspaper. And, I mean, just browsing this list, these these are names of people that are still alive and people that you would know by name. I want to say this, though, as well. The the list I'm looking at, nobody on this list has ever been convicted of anything, you know, heinous, anything weird, uh, and to my knowledge has never even been suspected of anything like that. Mm-hmm. But of course, because Ted Fritz is a powerful individual in this area, many of these attendees would be politicians, law enforcement, local government officials, and so on. Now, Robert Mistrell's role at these parties, I guess he worked at these parties. He says, along with other boys, his age and sometimes younger, his job was part of like the wait staff, almost, you know, wait on the guest dress up in a tank top and shorts and be, he said he was told to be accommodating of the male guest. So Robert says in like, turn, like check their coats and give them hand jobs. Uh, <laughs> uh we should, sorry, let me check your coat. Stop saying jokes. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to laugh. This is a, this is a very 
It's, I mean, it's so disturbing, though. It's disturbing. It's and it's a difficult. It's a difficult thing to discuss a little bit here. Um, Robert says for whatever his job was at these parties, right? And we also got to we also got to mention these are his claims, right? We have to then determine. This is or, a guy, this guy's a, a thief, a known thief, right? Yeah, uh, he has some problems. We we don't want to assume that all of, all of his allegations are false, though. Either I mean, or truthful. I think I think there's a weird th- we're yes, we're wading weird. in weird waters here, right? Mm-hmm. He, well, so Robert says in turn for his role at these parties, he was provided with money, temporary residence at Fritz's mansion, mm-hmm. and he was also allowed to drive luxury cars. Now, while Fritz remained the editor of the Californian, the paper stayed away from coverage of the Lords of Bakersfield. So Fritz's bigger connection seems to be that of a close connection to Robert Mistrell, according to Robert Mistrell, and the fact that he is pretty much running the Californian, the newspaper, and many people suspect all these years later that that's why that newspaper stayed away from you know, thorough coverage of anything that could possibly involve any of these lords of Bakersfield or naming names or throwing people under the bus. And then, like I said, I mean, just a fine different sources about this case was really difficult. Well, one thing that is super interesting to me, and I, I, I'm going to go out on the ledge here and say that it's probably, I think you're supposed to say out on a limb, right? Not out on the ledge. No, I think you can do. I think you can, <laughs> you can go on out. You, you can go, go out, out on, on anything both. you want. Yeah. Go ahead and jump. We don't care. My people say go out on a plank. Go out on a bridge. Yeah. Um. So th- this is where I think I'm. I'm starting to see some really strong evidence, or at least people that are willing to take their suspicions to the to the to the furthest out. Right. So. This man who's in charge of the Californian, of the newspaper, he ends up dying of AIDS in 1997. His sister, his flesh and blood, his sister took over as managing editor. In 2003, she is the one that gave Robert Price the go-ahead to write the expose on the Lords, even though it would point the finger at the paper that she was now in charge of and her own brother. Yeah, but if you know it's I I would think being related to him if she knew that something wrong happened that at some point you have to allow that information to come out. Well, and I want to give her plenty of credit as well as the newspaper itself for writing a wrong, mm-hmm. you know, in correcting their missteps through through over the years. Um, but one of the most disturbing things that Robert attested to during this trial was the wink and nod arrangement that allowed certain men to check out court supervised juveniles like library books from the boys home and return them a few hours later. Mm, right. Yeah. Well, th- this was, I took this from, uh, Robert Price's article. Now, Mistrell alleged in the trial testimony and later in his own failed lawsuit against the state that he and other boys were taken from the boys' home under the excuse that they were going to be given jobs. But he says instead they were drugged, sexually abused, and forced to participate in porn before being returned to the boys' home as if nothing happened. Yeah, that's a, that's awful. So further, Robert claims that he was used as a scout to recruit other boys for parties thrown by these older men where young men were desired to be amendable to their advances. But Robert's trial testimony seems to have been shoved under the rug. In other words, none of this scandal really leaked out until much, much later. So at first we have no leakage, and then then we have a lot of leakage. 
Well, no investigation into his claims of abuse and statutory rape ever ensued after the trial. In the end, 18-year-old Roy pled guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life without parole. And Robert was convicted of first-degree murder by a jury receiving a sentence of 31 years to life. Well, this is difficult, too, because you, you do want to believe somebody that is accusing somebody of, of these heinous crimes. You don't want to think that somebody would uh, go through this, uh, endure this suffering, and and just be making this stuff up, right? But mm -hmm. then it becomes this, this double-edged sword for me where it's like you go, well, he, he's basically creating this giant conspiracy, and then it's like, well, where's your evidence of it? Well, because it's such a giant conspiracy, you go, well, that's why there's no evidence. They don't want this stuff to get out out there. Does it make does that make any sense? It makes total sense, number one. But then let's add in to the fact that there doesn't seem to be any investigation into his claims. Yeah. So where you go, all right, well, are these allegations? Is this just a man that's on trial for first degree murder who's coming up with excuses excuses and yeah. maybe playing to the the crowd a bit and saying you know this this was a jury trial mm -hmm. um he's technically under the age of 18 even though he's going to be tried as an adult mm -hmm. you look look what you have here in, in the end you have an 18 year old roy who pled guilty and gets first degree murder uh well, pled guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life without parole. And then you have 17-year-old Robert, who is convicted of first-degree murder by a jury, receiving a sentence of 31 years to life. Think about those two scenarios real quick, all right? We have an adult who pled guilty and received no, you know, leniency, leniency yeah. for him pleading guilty to where we have to go through the trial and convict Robert of first degree murder. And he's actually shown some leniency for a couple of reasons. One, probably because the jury, even though he's being tried as an adult, he's viewed as a child being 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the jury's probably viewing him as some, some type of victim. Right. So he gets 31 years to life. Now keep in mind, I do understand that the story being, being put forth is that Robert simply was involved in the plan that created this plan of murder and then sat by while it happened and then helped dispose of the body. Right. Whereas Roy showed up and, and really carried out this brutal, brutal murder. So right, I, I, you, I get that there the is a difference that, there. Right. But you're the reason that the vicious ver murder is there though, right? Correct. I mean, Edwin Buck may have never been murdered at all, let alone murdered by Roy, yeah, you had, know, if, had this Robert not set it up. If I took Jeffrey Dahmer and, and Ted Bundy to a party and it didn't end well, that's that's on me, right? Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. So, yeah, this, this is where it gets very difficult. And the other thing I want to point out, too, while we're on this whole thought is you heard that number that, that we pushed forward there was that he claimed, Robert claimed like 150 men in both Bakersfield and Los Angeles that he slept with before he was the age of 18. I'm not saying that Robert's lying. I'm just saying that's a very high number. That's a very high number. And there were a lot of people along the way that he named that we didn't name. And a lot of these people are involved in law enforcement and prosecuting criminals and things of that nature. And at some point you start to go, like you said, you want to believe him. You want to say, Hey, let's investigate these allegations. And that's where I think this whole thing went wrong, mm -hmm. that his allegations don't seem to have been investigated. But then at some point you go 150 men. How, how can that be? Well, the, the and then on top of that, you go, Every one of these people that he's naming is involved in some, they have, they're in some, you know, line of power. They, right. they, they have, they're this men of guy, influence. And right. you start to wonder, you can't, at some point it can't be everybody. 
It's not everybody that's involved in this. Well, right, and is and I was, I struggled with this a little bit this week because again, you know, I don't want to victim blame at all. You know, if that's the case, if these horrible acts happened to this kid or this kid was put into these awful situations, you don't want a victim blame. But I think it's it's also a little different. You're you're not just coming forward and saying, "Look, this is what happened to me," and here's the evidence. We have somebody that is you know, um, a part of like a, a boy's home, a part of a community where he's in and out of trouble. So he's around these law enforcement officers. He's around people of power. Mm-hmm. So when you end up getting caught with something, you get, you end up getting busted with something. It's not that out of line to think maybe this kid is so messed up and has so much, um, d- uh, disdain for, um, authority that he just goes look uh this one cop he arrested me a long time ago his name was uh jack whatever right well he was in on it too he was having sex with boys all oh, this 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 teacher that was mean to me oh yeah they were having sex with boys too you know it's not that far-fetched to to think that 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 story could be created by a, a troubled youth and that's why these allegations really should have been looked into further well they weren't investigated at all, it seems like. So they should have been investigated. Look, this is a story with with so many injustices, but that is one of the big ones. want to thank you guys for listening thanks for telling a friend and sharing on social media much love and cheers and until tomorrow be good be kind and don't let it